thanks for the introduction. Um, I thought it was interesting what Rufus and uh, the French guy was saying about um, uh, like mutation and how like motion designers are going to print design, web designers are going into print design. Um, so my career is very much about mutation. I started as a product designer and then I moved into digital art and 3D. So tonight I just want to like take you through that transformation and um, like show you some of my work, some of my early work and like how I broke through and then some of like my very, very latest work. And there's a lot of slides and it's, so it's all about the work and if I could I would not talk at all and just show the work because that's the most important thing. So, yeah, my career has these three distinct segments. And so I graduated 2004 from the Royal College of Art, studied product design. And this slide shows my felt chandelier project. And this was my first mass produced product. And it was manufactured by Innermost Lighting. So, graduated and got royalties off that, and that was cool. And my work at that time was all about getting in the workshop, using your hands, and like making, like just trying to make cool stuff. So this is like all the models and stuff from the felt chandelier process. And then later on, I made this version, which is like an evolution of the chandelier, except this was completely designed on the computer. You can see the wireframe on the right-hand side. So I started doing 3D uh, partly out of necessity and partly out of curiosity. So like money was tight to make all the things that I wanted to make. So I used the computer to bring my ideas to life. And the deeper and deeper I got into 3D technology, I began to lose the desire to actually make physical things. Because like on the left, there's this, like this hyper-real, photorealistic render of my products. And seeing this on the computer screen just made them real in my mind. So I didn't see the point of like going to the workshop and making things. So this was a turning point in my career, and I moved into the, like, head first into, like, 3D industry. So I set up a uh, 3D visualization business called Firewire Studios, and this serviced uh, architects and the oil and, oil and gas industry where I live in Aberdeen. This business' main purpose was to pay the bills. While I worked on all the side projects, it didn't make any money at all. And then over time, this would change. I began to get commissions based on all the side projects I was doing, and the personal work gradually managed to take over, and I managed to stop doing uh, 3D visualization work altogether, and I was able to basically follow the things I was passionate about. So the Design Heroes, uh, this is my first substantial body of work where I started to explore 3D technology as a creative medium in itself. It was no longer about using the computer as a tool to visualize product ideas, but about using the computer to create interesting images in their own right. I used to collect lots of design books and expensive furniture and products, and I started to realize that the image is perhaps even more important than the thing. Like, our only experience of these high-end design objects would be through magazines, books, or going to exhibitions. So that kind of legitimized, for me, as a product designer, just making images. So, and, uh, Design Heroes was also one of the first projects where I started to um, explore dimensional illustrated typography. And the, the reason for exploring typography was that I was a designer, and if I was going to make images, then I felt they should somehow be useful. So I thought that creating words and letters would be a good idea because it's functional and it's utilitarian. So a letter is very useful in the same way that a chair or a lamp is useful. So I'm like really like passionate and inspired by architecture. So I had the idea to remix uh, all the work of my design heroes, and I would try and decode what I thought was great about their work, and I would create it as their first names. So this is the work of Vittori Sotsas, who's like a legendary Italian uh, furniture designer. And I was really drawn to his like brightly colored furniture and products from the postmodern period. So I took this aesthetic and I remixed it into like words and letter forms. And this is the final piece. So this is a toy. So it takes like some of these classic furniture elements and it's like 
mutated and manipulated into typography. And then there came uh, Frank Gehry, uh, like, he's just an unbelievable, awesome architect, like audacity to do something like the Bilbao uh, Guggenheim Museum. So I took that and made Frank. So you, on the left-hand side, you see the letter F, and that's the Bilbao Museum. And then, so you go along, each letter is inspired by a building and something from his, his portfolio. So it was like my heroes and inspired me to do this. And then I did seven all together, and this is Taro Ando, Japanese architect. And then I did Toyo Ito, who's another Japanese architect. Like, he just, his work's really, really beautiful. It's these simple geometric shapes, and they're just like perforated with all these like intricate patterns and details. And then Zaha Hadid, the, the British architect, her work's like, looks like products. It's all organic and it flows. So I, I took like Stanley knives and stuff. So then this brings on to thinginess. So Design Heroes was focused on architecture, but these next slides are going to show like an evolution where we're starting to do architecture and typography and then moving into like objects and like the everyday things around us. So fun and games. Uh, this was a, a cover I did for Reader's Digest magazine. Unfortunately, they didn't use this because they did something lame instead. Um, yeah, it was, it was terrible. Uh, and it's very difficult to talk about this work in a, in a certain sense because conceptually, conceptually, they're like unbelievably simple. It's just verbs, nouns, and adjectives made out of stuff in a, like a really expressive way. So the real beauty for me in this work is in the making. So it's about the, the cute interplay of elements and like the design and the detail that goes into and the, and the craftsmanship of each of these pieces. So it's, it's all about like the color and the surface and the glossiness and how matte it is. Um, so like, like ever since college of like being obsessed with materials. Um, there's nothing I like more than looking at like swatches from like samples, like wood samples or leather samples. Um, that's what gives me a real kick. So Summer Streets, this is my first big commercial project. It's like nearly four years old now. Um, and it's the one project that art directors reference the most for my portfolio when like pitching for new work. Um, yeah, so Summer Streets basically every Every year in New York, in the summertime, they close down Park Avenue, and then they just open up to cyclists and pedestrians. And then they asked me to do like a series of images, like activity-based messages. So this is bike, and we take the architecture from Park, uh, Park Avenue, like the MetLife building, like these iconic elements, and we fuse them with like bike parts to create this. So, um, so other ones were play. And there was run with like manhole covers and like sneaker mutations and stuff. And then there was walk. And then off the back of that, it kind of led on to another project. This is a project for Xbox. Um, they had like all their download services, like uh, movies and audio and games. And they wanted some posters to celebrate this. So this is watch, did like movie set and green screen, green screen and stuff. Then there was listen, there's like audio elements, old school TDK tape cassettes mutated into letters. Um, yeah. Then there was play for games. So this leads into Land of the Free, which is a more recent project, uh, 2012. And this is a personal project. And like personal projects are a really, really important part of my activity. And regardless of how busy I am, I always try and make the effort and the time to do personal projects. Because personal projects is where you can really do, like that's where you can innovate and do, push yourself to do things better and more importantly to do things differently. It's how you develop your own voice as an artist. So, spent a lot of time in California. Um, 
I would do like road trips from San Francisco to Lake Tahoe, and the freeways are just like littered on the weekends with recreational vehicles, and they're like just like fascinating objects. So I had this idea to take these RVs and make like really really cool um, typography sculptures. So these are the rough sketches. I had like a really clear defined idea of what I was going to look like. Usually when I do a project. I have no idea. There's a distinct lack of vision, and I kind of make it up as I go along. But with this, it was just like an idea it clicked, and it happened very quickly. So I, I do. I work in three, 3D uh, software, Cinema 4D, and this is the first uh, 3D test for the RV. So it's land, and uh, it looked amazing. So I carried on, and I did Land of the Free with all different RVs and trailers. And this is all stacked. And this is another view. And uh, the personal work is really important because it feeds the commercial work. And I see the portfolio is a way to inspire creative directors and art directors. And Land of the, uh, project, uh, Land of the Free project leads nicely into the new fares uh, for Transport for London with MNC Saatchi. So I got the brief, really simple. New fares arrive. January 2014. And so this is a scamp that the agency sent me. Really, really basic, really simple, which is great for me because it just opens up a, a broad range of possibilities of how I'm going to design and make this, make this poster. Sometimes briefs are like really detailed and it's a total turn off. Um, and so these are the many drawings I did. And I knew right away that in order to capture the essence and the personality of these, of the, of all the different vehicles, you'd have to like focus on the front of the train. A bit like a, it's almost like Thomas the Tank Engine type shit. Um, and also, color was really important because that's what gives gives all the, the services their real identity. So these are the color sketches. So as I said, I work in 3D. I don't use uh, photography at all in any of my work, except when creating um, textures or materials for my models. So this is the basis of the tube train. I began by creating an extruded profile of the train and would gradually add in more details over time. So this is the front of the cabin, and you can see the chassis. So a lot of the um, detailed design work is all done in 3D. Is it's the best way to really get a sense of the proportions of the trains and getting the right thickness and the weights of the ladders which is like really important for like the overall legibility of the piece. And these are, so these are the finished render trains. On the left, we've got the tube train, and then for January, and then we, on the right, we have 2014, which is the, the DLR train. And on the left, we have Arrive, and on the right, we have Fares. And then you put that all together, and you get like this pretty cool poster. Really graphic, really cool colors, and it's like dimensional. It feels physical and like tangible. So the, re the reason, like, reason I did this project is um, because it's like a really high visibility project. This is all around London, and millions of commuters would see this, and that was like a real kind of buzz for me. And also, like I got lots of messages once it went live. Like people seen on the station, they would say, they would email me and say, "Is that yours? Did you do that?" And that's the ultimate compliment for me because it proves that from the from doing land of the free and the personal work that I do, it's it proves that you have a voice as a creative. You know, there's lots and lots of people doing 3D typography now, but it's great that you can kind of be distinct. So auto aerobics project. When I was uh, preparing this presentation, I was asked what drives my creativity. And for me, um, creativity is like a sport. <clears throat> it's about competing with myself to do things better than before, and comp competing with everyone else in the creative community to do things differently. And all aerobics is very much this type of project. So there's no big idea for this project. It's all about starting a piece of work with a small idea and having the faith that something interesting is really going to happen along the way, that will give the project 
a kind of a momentum and bring it to life. So it was how it started is just me like sitting in my computer in Scotland, daydreaming of New York, and I have like really, lots of memorable experience of wandering around New York in the winter time as the sunlight goes down. So I, I took that tiny idea and I built this digital model of the kind of Brooklyn, New York location and tried to capture the atmosphere and the texture of this place. And then, and then this is kind of the next phase. So there was a Pontiac car that was like a prop in this scene. So I decided to make more of this car. So I did some more uh, dimensional typography. And when I said earlier about doing things differently and trying to avoid doing, getting into like habitual routines, like just reverting to doing typography, it was trying to get away from that. So I did this, and it looks pretty cool, but I'd kind of been there and had done it, so I had to move on and abandon this idea. And then I started playing with multiples, and had the idea to just like hollow out the inside of the vehicles and interlock them. And this is when, this is like the, the bang moment of when this project happened. This is the one that gave it the momentum. And there's some other angles. So the, like through the process, I also got the title. So auto aerobics came, and even just having a title meant I could kind of, it gave the project life as well. So it meant it had something to build it around. Another one. I do quite a lot of editorial work. Um, and it brings with it its own unique challenges. Usually it's like time-based, because they're in a, a big time crunch. Um, so when I said earlier about avoiding doing typography in like the cars, the, it quickly changes when somebody's going to pay you to do it. So <laughs> this is the late, latest issue of Spectrum magazine, probably out next week. And they asked me to illustrate their top tech cars issue. So we just like developed on what I did in all aerobics, but tried to do it a little bit differently. So it's the front of the grill extruded. You get these like cool profiles and stuff. And I was also asked to do a uh, cover for Time. So this is about the renaissance of American manufacturing. It's called Made in the USA. And when working in the editorial space, like the news agenda can change quite quickly. So I was, as I was preparing the final uh, piece, I had an email from the art editor to say that it wasn't going to run because the Pope resigned. Uh, that, that sucked. And then, <laughs> so I thought this project was gone. And then maybe like six weeks later, they got back in touch to say they're going to run the project. And then um, Margaret Thatcher died. It, uh, that that kind of sucked. But fortunately, it was too late to run the Thatcher story, so they, they ran this story. So that's good for me. And this is just some more angles. Uh, food and words. So I did a project for Pringles with Gray in London. And this is for their North American campaign. Um, Pringles client was like really awesome, great client, because they knew exactly what they wanted and they were very specific about what they wanted. And the most important thing was that the ads looked yummy and delicious. And the fact that the lettering is very difficult to read wasn't a problem with them. Because <clears throat> like sometimes we'll get a client where they try and tick as many boxes as possible. It's got to be like legible and it's got to be this. It's got it's like blah, and then, but they were really brave, and they, they like really went with a, a really cool project. So that was, that was sour cream, that was cheese, sour cream, barbecue. So yeah, it's cool. And then sneaker boots. So I've shown a lot of typography, but I also do a lot of illustration projects. Sneaker boots is a series I did with Nike. They were launching a new range of products where they took some of the classic silhouettes, such as Air Max 90, and like elevated them into boots. And they asked me to help create a series of iconic cityscapes for the shoe photography to sit in. And my thinking was that rather than like just recreate the city with all the like normal landmarks, it'd be cool to reimagine these landmarks as something new. <clears throat> so for the Air Max 90, they used London. So on the left, you've got like Big Ben. So it's like taking it, deconstructing it, 
bending it, mutating it into a new object this, with a skate ramp attached to it. And there's a gherkin and a shard and just like, let's take a teacup, put it inside the gherkin. And then on the right, there's um, Paris, Shanghai. So you can probably see like there's a louvre that's been inverted and converted into a basketball court. And Arc de Triomphe is being propped up by some basketballs. And so there was, there was a pretty big campaign. They had a ton of products. Um, so uh, this is Tokyo for the Nike Free uh, sneaker boot. And then we also did New York for the duck boot. And we did like Shanghai and we did Paris as well. But I'm not showing Paris because they were really like iffy about copyrights and stuff and like using their famous landmarks. Um, and this is my very latest piece. So yesterday was Air Max Day. And the, the guys at Nike asked me to create this like logo lockup. And we took the idea of the airbags you find in all the shoes. And we created some inflated uh, typography. And that's cool. And that's it. That's my presentation. So I made this piece over the weekend.